So God then connects Adam being his representative and image bearer. God connects that to a mission. And God commissions Adam with this mission in Genesis 1, verse 28. God gives us Adam and all humanity a mission. Here it is. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Okay, so God blesses the first humans with a mission. The mission isn't just about having kids. That's a part of it. Adam lived on mission for God as he represented God and God's rule in the world. So Adam was to represent God and multiply for God. The mission is to rule the world on behalf of God and spread that rule. Or here, here's I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it. God's mission is for his people to spread his rule through multiplication. God's mission is for his people to spread his rule through multiplication. So how does Adam do it that? Well, it doesn't last long. Go to Genesis 3. Genesis 3 describes humanity's failure to spread God's rule as Adam and Eve instead listen to the serpent and then rebel against God's rule. And so now, in Adam, all of humanity has fallen away from God with a heart of rebellion against him. And that's the fall. That's what we're still living in right now. The fall, it's all around us. We experience it. And yet, God moves right away to restore his mission and redeem his people. It all starts with, the re redemption starts with God calling a guy named Abraham. And, and through Abraham's family, God says, He'll bring back blessing to the world. So Abraham's family is picking up the original mission of Genesis 1 and carrying it on. Abraham's family eventually becomes the nation of Israel. And here's how God summarizes Israel's mission in Exodus 19. This is Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. God says to them, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So Abraham's descendants, Israel, were blessed to be God's own people. And God commissions them to be a kingdom of priests. That means that as a people, they were to point the surrounding nations, they were to point the surrounding nations back to God. They pointed the surrounding nations to God as, as they themselves lived holy lives and kept their covenant with God. So the question, as you read throughout the story of the Old Testament, the question is whether Israel would live out its identity as a holy nation and therefore be a blessing to all nations, or instead of representing God's holy rule, Will they rebel against God's rule? Will Israel live out the Genesis 1 mission or the Genesis 3 failure? And as you read, as many of you have through the Old Testament and the Old Testament story, you know what happens. Because of their sin, Israel is exiled away from the land just like Adam and Eve were exiled away from the land, the garden, in Genesis 3. Now, there are some bright spots along the way, but the brightest spots and most hopeful parts of the Old Testament story actually point forward. They point forward to a second Adam who would undo what the first Adam did in his rebellion they point forward to an ultimate descendant of Abraham who would truly bring blessing to all nations. And they point forward to the supreme Israelite who would perfectly keep all the regulations of the covenant that Israel didn't and couldn't keep. And they point forward to God himself who would himself fulfill the mission he gave us. In other words, they point forward to Jesus the Redeemer. 
Jesus is the climax of the Bible story. The whole Bible leads up to his coming. And then after he comes, the rest of the Bible explains what's the big deal about Jesus and all that he's done. Jesus brought us sinful humans back to a place of blessing by taking on himself the curse of sin on the cross. And so he died in our place, was buried and rose from the dead, conquering sin, the serpent, and death himself. This is what we believe. This is what we would implore for every person to believe even this morning, to put your faith in this risen and resurrected Savior. Because now, this is Jesus' commission to us. Before Jesus ascended back to be with God the Father, Jesus spoke to his people with his resurrected kingly authority, and in his authority, he blesses his people again with a mission. Jesus blesses his people with a mission. So in Genesis 1, we saw that God's mission is for his people to spread his rule through multiplication. How does Jesus bless his people with mission? Let's read it. Matthew 8, we just read it, we just heard it, but let me read it again. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So what's different between the mission that God gives uh, to his people in Genesis 1 and the mission Jesus gives to his people in Matthew 28? In one sense, nothing. The mission is still for God's people, us, to spread his rule through multiplication. But now, God's sinful people are redeemed. We're forgiven. The presence of God will be with us always through the Holy Spirit. And now, God's rule doesn't just spread by having kids. Now, God spreads his rule as we seek out those far from him and tell them about Jesus. And as others believe this good news about Jesus, we teach and train them in what it means to follow Jesus. So we don't just make disciples of our own family. We disciple those in our neighborhood and among the, uh, and among the nations because that's our mission. God is missional. And he sends us to spread his rule through multiplication. That's God's mission in the Bible, a summary of it at least. All right, so now let's talk about God's mission for us as a church, for Calvary. We saw that God's mission is for God's people to spread his rule through multiplication. Well, you're all smart. What does that mean for us? Well, God's mission for Calvary is what? To spread the rule of Jesus through multiplication. And there's kind of two ways we can break that down. One obvious application is that we need to be a conversion community. I know we're moving slides quickly here, but we need to be a conversion community, a conversion community. Our pulse as a church can only be detected if we're constantly praying and planning and preparing to go to people who are far from Jesus, tell them about Jesus, and as they believe the good news about Jesus, teach them what it looks like to follow him. That's so important. I, I can't help but ask you if you would pray for me in my own life of doing this. I, I don't want to just bank on the opportunities that I have as a pastor to tell, be about, tell people about Jesus. I want to do this in my own life, and I, I need you to pray for me that I would do this, that I would see the opportunities that God opens and that I would walk through them courageously with wisdom, perseverance, pursuing people in my life who knew Jesus. I want to do what Jesus is calling all of us to do, to spread his rule through multiplication, through evangelism and discipleship. We don't exist so that those of us who already know Jesus can feel comfortable with how our preferences are being met. That's not our mission. And that's actually one thing that I hate about our location here on Green Pond Road, because we're kind of nestled between two country clubs, right? And you kind of get that vibe around here. Now, there's nothing wrong with country clubs. I mean, even people who, need, who play golf need Jesus. <laughs> Maybe I should say, especially people who play golf need Jesus. 
But our surroundings can shape how we think about ourselves and our identity and our mission. And Calvary isn't a country club where you can sign up for a certain tea time and then lounge back with whatever you want from the offered menu. That's not who we are. Instead of thinking that we're a country club, think of this analogy, that we are a family-run army hospital. We're family-run because we are the family of God, with God as our father and Jesus as our older brother and king. And we, in Christ, we are brothers and sisters in him. We're a hospital because we're here for hurting people, and we're all hurting We all need the gospel every day. We're needed and we're needy. And we're in a battle. We are on the front line to spread the rule of Jesus. We fight together against our own temptations that pull us away from Jesus. We fight together to see others make much of Jesus. We fight together to multiply Jesus' rule as people hear and believe the good news. I'm reminded of the passage of of when Peter uh, confesses that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the Christ. And this is what Jesus then says in response to that. This is Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19. Jesus says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you bound on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. There's a lot there, but I just want you to see in that passage where Jesus' rule on earth is explicitly experienced. Jesus' rule is seen in his communities, his gatherings, called churches. And these gatherings are communities filled with people who believe and belong. These communities are are filled with people who believe the truth about Jesus and belong to Jesus and, and therefore belong to one another. These communities, churches, are the front line of God's mission today, and that's why we need to be a conversion community. And that's why we need to multiply as a community. So again, when I say God's mission for Calvary is to spread the rule of Jesus through multiplication, there's two things I'm talking about. We need to be faithful to share the gospel, to make disciples, to become part of this community, Calvary, where we experience Jesus' rule. And we need to spread that rule of Jesus by starting new communities of disciples where the rule of Jesus can be experienced. And that's why we've been praying and talking for for some time now about planting a church here in the Lehigh Valley. And we've we've talked before about reasons, but it's been a while. So let let me share again, why are we talking and praying about planting a church here in the Lehigh Valley? And there's three reasons we've shared. First, to obey the Great Commission and make disciples. To obey the Great Commission and make disciples. The fact is the population of the Lehigh Valley is growing. And you experience, I mean, you see all the, the growth. You see the buildings that are, you, you, we all know it's growing. They say that by 2050, there will be about a million people here in the Lehigh Valley. So even if Calvary were to double, triple, or even quadruple in size, we would not have a big enough impact. So the question is, what are we doing to go and make disciples of those one million people? And there needs to be two answers. Calvary being a conversion community and Calvary multiplying into other conversion communities. The Lehigh Valley needs more gospel preaching, Jesus-loving, Bible embracing churches. Second reason why are we planting a church? We're planting a church to follow Jesus, who calls us to sacrificially serve and give and share. 
sacrificially serve and share. And so we, we joyfully give our time and our talent and our treasure to see Jesus multiply his communities. Now, I say joyfully, but I also recognize this is where we're going to feel the pain. Because in planting a church, we're sending out some of our best leaders and servants and givers. But that's not a bad thing. Because the impulse in the kingdom of God is to give and share and send. And that makes it beautiful and countercultural. It's beautiful because it also forces new leaders and servants to step up. I mean, the church plan itself will have new leaders and servants, and Calvary as a sending church will have to raise up new leaders and servants as some are called away. But that's healthy. That's biblical. God's kingdom spreads through sacrifice. Who would sign up for something like that, though? I mean, who would purposely, why would we purposefully send 10% of our people to start a new church and to make things harder around here. And why would you want to be a part of the 10% going and start something new from scratch? Well, the only reason any of us would do this is because our hearts have been captured by the resurrected Savior and there is no sacrifice too big for him And there is nothing too radical for us to do if it will help others know and follow and worship King Jesus. Because that's our mission. So the more we do things like Jesus, as we talk about Jesus and point to Jesus, the healthier we will be as a church. Sending people to plant will help us be healthier. The third reason we want to plan a church is because we know God's kingdom is bigger than Calvary. We know God's kingdom is bigger than Calvary. Our mission is to spread the rule of Jesus through multiplication, not the rule of Paul or the pastors or the elders, not the rule of the congregation, not the rule of the new church plant, not the rule of whatever is popular in churches today. We're here to spread the rule of Jesus. So let's give it everything we have for the sake of Jesus' kingdom and rule. A couple of you have asked me in, uh, in the course of the years, what's the difference between a church plant and a church split? Well, when I was in Louisville, Kentucky, I worked as an assistant pastor at a church uh, with about 150 people. And I quickly learned that a a decade prior to my coming, uh, that church had planted another church. But I also learned it was an involuntary church plant. The church had been heavily divided into two camps, a traditional camp that wanted things to be done a certain way and a, a contemporary camp that wanted things done a certain way. And like the Hatfield and McCoys, they both stubbornly stood their ground. So the denomination's district superintendent uh, had to come in and convince the two camps to go their own ways. And so one of them left and started a new church. Well, that's a church split. I know it because I heard the bitterness from people in both sides. And that's why three years ago, as we prayed about this and talked about it as a congregation, we described our vision as a church with the words, unify and multiply. Unify as a family and multiply for the mission. Because a healthy church plant comes from a healthy church where there is unity in the gospel for Jesus. So it is out of our unity we now long to multiply and send like-minded, gospel-saturated, Jesus-adoring brothers and sisters to plant a church. Not because of different preferences, We're not planting a church so that different preferences can be satisfied. We're planting because there are still so many people who need Jesus. 
And it's our mission to spread the rule of Jesus by starting new communities of disciples where the rule of Jesus can be experienced. So now we're excited to take the next step. And the next step is to pray for wisdom and clarity for Pastor Zach and Leah and the elders as we consider Zach to lead a church plant from Calvary. Do any of you know Pastor Zach? (laughs) All right. A lot of excitement. We've been talking and planning and praying about a church plant for uh, about seven years now. And at the end of last summer, the Lord put, it, put the burden on and desire in Zach's heart for church planning. And through the fall, Zach and the elders, we talked a lot about it, we prayed a lot about it. Uh, in February, Zach and Leah went to a church planning assessment in California uh, where they were, uh, incur- um, where they were uh, leaders of our conference of churches, kind of uh, evaluated them and did a lot of stuff with them. It was an intense few days for them. And at the end, the leaders of the assessment were really encouraged by Zach and Leah. They identified big and little things for Zach to work on before he plants a church. And one of the action steps was for Zach to uh, go through a church, a six-month church planter's residency, which he started last week. The residency is designed for him to do while he continues his, uh, his normal other ministry responsibilities here. And so as Zach goes through this residency and engages the other suggestions from the assessment, we're trusting that the Lord will make things clear to Zach, to Leah, to the elders, and to the whole congregation. So Lord willing, next fall, I can come back to you and let you know that we would like the congregation to affirm Zach as our church planting pastor. But until that, we have one simple but humongous ask of you. And that is to pray. Pray for Zach and Leah. Pray for the elders. Pray for Calvary. Pray for the Lord's clear leading on a church plant for his, for his glory. Here's kind of an analogy of, of where we are on this. Let's say that the official start of a church plant is like a wedding. You back up from the wedding. Plans for the wedding begin. Really start to move forward once there is a proposal, an engagement. For church planning, that engagement happens when we as members affirm God's call on a church planting pastor like Zach. Well, we're not at that place yet either, Lord willing, we will be next fall. So where are we at in the process? Well, we're at the place where we have put down a big deposit on a ring. And it will be very soon that we'll actually buy the ring And perhaps I may very literally get down on my knee and ask Zach if he'll be our church planning pastor. That's kind of where we're at. So you can see why we need prayer. The first church planters in Acts were called and commissioned in the context of a prayer meeting. So pray. Our mission is to spread the rule of Jesus through multiplication. That can only happen through prayer. So here are two immediate ways to do this. First, can you commit to praying for Zach and Leah for the next few months, from now through August? If you want, you can sign up for a monthly newsletter that Zach is putting together to kind of give a monthly update on ways that you can pray and also to give some more information about what a church plan is even all about and what does that mean and uh, when you leave the sanctuary there are some tables that are set up where you can sign up for that monthly um, email newsletter if you want to receive it now you may have questions you're welcome to interact with zach or the elders any elder but i do need to warn you that some of your biggest questions that you have we don't have answers to yet the main question everyone asks is where where will we plant And the answer is, we don't know. I will say this, though. It will not be between two country clubs. (laughs) But when the ring is on the finger, Zach and the elders will lean into those discussions even more. 
For now, the most important thing we can do is talk to God about it, to pray. The second way to do this is for us to actually pray right now. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to pray for the next five minutes, and we're, we're going to have our final song. And here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to give you a topic of what to pray, and then I'm going to give you a minute to pray about that on your own. And then we're going to do that five different times. So I'm going, to give, I'm going to give you five different topics, and then you can pray for a minute on your own about that topic. All right? So let's shift our focus to the Lord now through prayer. Let's go to him now. First thing I want you to pray for, I want you to pray for your own heart. Is your heart captured by Jesus and his mission for you to spread his rule through multiplication? Take a minute to pray for your own heart. Now pray for your own life of evangelism and multiplying. Who in your life can you move towards with the goal of introducing them to Jesus? So pray that you would faithfully point others to Jesus. Pray now for Zach and Leah. Pray for their marriage. Pray for their parenting of Wilbur, Lucy, and Maisie. Pray for Jesus to protect and rule over the Michalak family. I pray for Zach and the elders. Pray for wisdom and discernment with decisions. Pray for us to be spirit-led in every decision.
And finally, let's pray for Calvary, that we would be a conversion community and that the Lord would be so kind to multiply us through a church plant.